so we move out of the favorite, which was chapter 37 of Genesis, and we did where we dealt with um, Joseph as this favored favored son of the of his father Jacob, and um, and we move into this phase where we're, we're calling it dreams. This second movement of the trilogy is called dreams because there's dreams being had in multiple areas, and God's giving wisdom to it, and we'll talk about that later. But today we kind of have this interesting moment in um, in Genesis chapter 39 where we see um, God dealing with the character of a person, God exposing character and, um, and showing uh, amazing character through this. So we're going to look at Joseph in Genesis 39, 1 to 23, and what we need to do in this is understand that um, quite often we in the church, we in our culture, We don't take sin seriously, but we at the Foundry and in our theology absolutely do. We absolutely take sin seriously because it does one thing. It separates us from God. And when you're separated from God, you are separated from life. So when we talk about this today, we're going to lean in and we're going to wrestle with this from Joseph's point of view, and then we'll pivot back uh, to look at it kind of from our context. So I'm going to invite you to join me. You can just read along. This is the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Just a quick understanding, Joseph had been sold by his brothers to Ishmaelite traders. The Ishmaelite traders then sold him to Potiphar, the captain of the guard. In Egypt, you'll find out about this. Uh, Genesis 39, um, 1 through 23 says this. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar, the man who bought him, put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge Of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he didn't concern himself with anything except the food he ate. You know you've got a good employee when you're like, I don't know if I should go with bacon or bacon and cheese. Like, that's all he had to think about, right? That's... It just amazes me how much trust he had. Now, Joseph was well-built, and he was handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house and attended to his duties, and none of the household servants were inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand, and he ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and run out of the house, she called the household servants, her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought brought to us to make sport of us. He came to a... He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him the story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story um, that his wife was told him, he said, this is how you're sl- I'm sorry. When his master heard the story his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But Joseph, while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness, and he granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison. I just think that's amazing. Like wherever he goes, he gets... 
and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in everything he did. I want to talk today about temptation. I want to take a minute and talk about temptation because we might have a misunderstanding. To be tempted is not to sin. To yield to temptation, to give in to temptation, is when we fall into sin. Temptation has a modus operandi. It has an MO. And what the MO of temptation is, is it gets to you when you're most vulnerable. And quite often, it comes when you're on top. When you've secured a place, well, for you at the top of the mountain. See, temptation likes to come at us when we're on the top. Joseph had risen above his harsh circumstances. At this point in his life, everything was going pretty well for him in light of the fact that just a few years earlier he'd been beaten up by his family and sold. He's doing pretty well here. Everything's going for him. Look at the text. He was successful. He was respected. And he was super good looking. Like, he, he really has the ball rolling for him. He's well-built. He's handsome. And, and, so, and temptation likes to come at us when we're at the top. Uh, we're flatlanders here in Michigan, right? If you fall off a cliff in Michigan, that is purely on you because <laughs> you got to find it and try. But where I'm from in Colorado, every once in a while, usually it's a Texan, we have somebody come to the high country, and, um, and they, they do something like, hey, check this out, you know, one of those hold my beer moments. And we scrape them off the valley floor, and we send them home because, well, when you're on the top of something, There's a long way to fall. There's this long fall. Joseph's on the top of something. He's at the top of the structure of Potiphar's house. He is up high. Nobody else is more important than he is. He has a long way to fall. And this temptation visits him in this moment when he's on top, when he's got everything going for him and he's overcome circumstances. But temptation also comes when you have survived, when you've maybe... um, You've gotten through one of the great tests of life. I don't know if you've had this, but you have a great test in life. Could be physical, emotional, the loss of someone. You go through this great test of life, and you get done, and you're like, oh, and you let your guard down. And that's quite often when temptation comes at you. Imagine with me what it felt like for Joseph when he's in this house. He's respected. He's loved. Contrast that with what happened with his brothers. Think of what it felt like to be respected and loved and at the top of a family structure for Joseph and how good that felt. He had survived being betrayed by his brothers, being beaten nearly to death, thrown in a well. Then they pondered his murder and decided on human trafficking. He survived a big ordeal. He survived the rejection of his family. And what we find, even in the loss of his freedom, Satan couldn't deter him from his God during this hardship. Satan couldn't deter him. So he tried something much more cunning. He tried charm and pleasure. But, but I want you to think with me just for a second because we in this day and age are a little too indulgent with God Almighty. And when something goes wrong, and the person at McDonald's doesn't give you a shamrock shake. They give you strawberry. You're like, why, God? And we get so mad and indignant over the littlest, dumbest things. We shake our fist at God and we say, why me? Why me? But look at Joseph's character in this. Look at his character. Satan couldn't deter him from his God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But, but if anybody had reason to be upset, it was J- Joseph. He'd been sold by his family, yet we never see him shaking his fist at God. We see him trusting in the character of God and trusting in God more than he does in his circumstances. So Satan comes at him from a different angle. He comes at him when he's survived this thing. He decides and he gets him on top. He comes at him from what? From this charming, pleasurable point. Imagine the wound inside Joseph's soul being rejected by his family, being sold off. Now, I'm sure we can, uh, you know, kind of sanitize it a little bit in this, but can you just imagine with me what it would be like to be sold by your family? That would leave a wound inside of you, and that wound would cry to be filled with affirmation, with someone's love and affection, and what does Satan send his way but the charming, pleasurable wife of his boss, saying, look how good looking you are. Mm, I could go for some of that. 
which chases him down. And he doesn't bite on it. He doesn't bite on it, but he comes, Satan sends Potiphar's wife into the mix, into that tender spot that says, you're attractive, you're lovely, I want you, come with me, be near me. When everyone else had thrown him away, now he's got someone saying, come to me. The temptation had to be vibrant, it had to be real, and he had to feel such a longing for such connection. But the reality is for him, he stood up to it. And we see the next reality, temptation doesn't come just one time. Temptation is not this thing that happens once. I think of temptation like the waves of the Pacific on the shores of California, just constantly boom, boom, all day, every day, pounding into the coastline. It's like temptation. Without fail, temptation is crashing onto the shores of our life continually continually baiting us and calling us into something that will erode the foundation of the life we built. Temptation doesn't come just once. Notice what Potiphar's wife did. She came to him day after day. Lust is relentless. And for some of you in this room, you're wanting to scream, amen, because it's just relentless. It doesn't come just once. It hammers day after day, and it preys on your weaknesses, those points in you that need validation, those places in you you feel so strong. It knows Satan knows how to get in there and wiggle in, and temptation just came at Joseph day after day after day, relentlessly, to the point that Joseph couldn't even be in the same room as that woman because her eyes were on him continually. Which tells us, well, maybe it tells us that temptation doesn't play by normal or fair rules. If you were in my youth group or if you're in my family, I like to cheat at games. I'm a bad person. I would literally push my grandmother down the stairs to win at Rummy Cube. And I don't even like Rummy Cube. I love to win. Actually, I hate to lose so much that I'll do anything not to. I can't play church league softball because... In 2004, I had an incident um, <laughs> with, with another church who was clearly in the wrong, and one of their members paid for it. And um, I, I can't, I, it just, it doesn't play. Temptation doesn't play by the rules. And many of us like our rules. We like life just so. And we expect temptation to come in the normal channels. But you got to think of temptation like you think of, well, playing cards with someone like me. I don't like to, so I, and I'm terrible. I, my kids call me on it. My wife teases me about it. My mother-in-law won't even play cards with me because I'm a cheater. Like, I'm always having fun, and I'm like, oh, like, we played Uno the other day, and I just, I picked a card off the deck. It was red. I had a yellow eight, and I just set it down, and a few minutes later, everybody's like, hey, and I'm like, I'm so sorry. It's a brokenness right here. I can't. I need to have Uno. Like, I just, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't play fair. Neither does temptation. Temptation doesn't play fair. Notice this woman's brazen efforts in her husband's home, asking to share her husband's bed with his prized servant. Lust is not ashamed. It doesn't blush. She says, come to bed with me. Come here. I'll make you happy. Come on. Come on. She's brazen. She's shameless in her approach, and she comes again and again. It is undeterred by the normal, lust is undeterred by the normal restraints of conscience, reputation, and decency. It doesn't hold anything valuable other than pleasing itself in the moment. And what do we see of the character of Joseph in this? We see that he is not biting on the temptation. And that's when things get scary because he does the right thing. But lust really quickly can turn to hate. And that's one of the scariest aspects of this story. Notice her reaction to Joseph finally wiggling out of his robe, which ironically was what she always wanted. But then he wiggled out of it and ran away. And she holds on to it. And she's like, if I can't have you, I will ruin you. I will ruin you. And she goes after him, and she plays the victim, and she was probably incredibly convincing to those around her. Except the ones who probably knew, the other household servants, who had seen her sketchy, wily ways. You know, have you ever had somebody who thinks they're pulling one over on you, and and they're just not? 
Can you imagine when she's like, that Hebrew tried to attack me. And all the servants are like, well, that's so sad, Potiphar's wife. Because you've been chasing him for weeks, you know. You know they knew, but nobody stood up. Nobody says anything. She holds on. She pleads with her husband. Oh, he tried to make sport of me. And the next thing we know is her her desire, her lust for for him turns to a hatred because she can't have it. And she will destroy it for rejecting her. And what we recognize, that once she was rejected and once she was ashamed, she would kill that which was wounding her. And that's how it always goes with lust. There are countless examples in Scripture of when lust is satisfied and the hatred turns after the satisfaction of lust and they hate the person. Or, in this case, where lust is rejected and they hate the person. True love and pure love would go to all lengths to save and preserve Joseph's life. She wanted him for nothing more than his body and the pleasure of it in her bedroom. And she would do anything to have it or she would ruin him in the process. Lust and temptation should be terrifying to us. We should look at it and recognize sinful lust turns to hate so quickly. She didn't care what happened to him. He ended up in prison. And she seemed perfectly fine with it. And the reality of this life is that lust turns to hate really quickly. And I know you've had it in your life the way I've had it in mine, where you were you were lusting after something. And it's not just sensual things. There's other kinds of lustful temptation. And you can go and you can try and you get it. In our culture, they call it buyer's remorse. Right? Where you get this thing you've wanted so long, the 36-foot boat that you've wanted so long, and you get it, get it home, and you're like, I shouldn't have done that, <laughs> you know? And then there's the lust where you do satisfy your lust on some sensual thing, and you, you finish whatever you're doing, and you go, oh, man, what is wrong with me? I hate that I did that, right? Lust turns to hate, period. It causes you to hate the thing you desire. So the question must be asked, why did Joseph say no? He had nothing to lose in saying no. He had nothing to lose. No one would have known about it. He was hidden under the cover of the darkness. She was his superior. She was important. He would only have been granted more favor and protection had he given in. No one was home. It would be their little secret. But remember what we said in the beginning of this. Sin doesn't just separate us from one another. It separates us from God. It separates us from God. And we recognize that we in this story can look at Joseph and admire him in a way we really should. This took courage for a young man to stand up like this. We can guess from the story that we've heard in Genesis 37 from his life experience that the young man was probably pretty lonely. He was in a foreign culture, in a foreign context, and though he was doing well and he was on the rise, the problem is he's pretty lonely and he misses his mom, he misses his dad, he might even miss a few of his brothers, and he feels alone, and this was a chance to have a relationship with someone, to be wanted, to be loved, and to be received. Why did he say no? Why would he say no to that? It was probably something he desired. But Joseph, as we said before, had a lot going for him. He was on top. He was successful. He was attractive, and usually those qualities produce an arrogance in someone. You know, I'm going to use this person because he's not my favorite and my son Ethan's not in the room. But Tom Brady, he's so beautiful. I mean, let's, can we, who thinks he's handsome? Come on, fellas. Yeah, the guy's like, I don't think he's handsome at all, but a little, right? (laughs) Right? And not only is he lovely, he's got like a handful of Super Bowl rings. His stadium's named after the world's best food, Kraft Mac and Cheese. He's married to a supermodel, you know, living the rough life. And you just look at him and you're like, oh, he seems to have everything going for him. He has all these qualities, Tom Brady does, all these qualities. You know, the guy can fly the pig, pig skin. He's inflappable under pressure. I mean, like I said, multiple Super Bowls, not this year. <laughs> but anyways, um, 
But like he just, he has, there's an it and Tom Brady owns it, right? He's got the, the kind of it thing. And there is an arrogance that exudes out of that. There is an arrogance. There's them and us, right? And Joseph could have been the them. He could have been arrogant. He was good looking. He was successful. He got sent to prison and they gave him the keys. Joseph had it going for him. Why did he say no? Because those traits that he has usually produce arrogance. They produce things that cause problems. But here's the thing that really answers our question, that tells the tale. It's what Joseph says at the end. He says to Potiphar's wife, my master has kept nothing from me. The only thing he hasn't given to me is you because you are his wife. And how could I do that to him? And how could I do this wicked thing and sin against God? He understood the heart of the matter is any sin is a sin against God. And those who love God hate sin, period. Those who love God hate sin, period. And we as the church have our pet sins that we hide in our lives and pretend it's no big deal. And God says it's a very big deal. It put my son on the cross. Sin separates us from God. And those who love God hate sin. Look at the life of Joseph. He wouldn't have it in secret. He wouldn't have it in public. And he wouldn't have it even if it cost him everything. Joseph understood what sin is. He called sin sin, and he didn't apologize. And we, in our culture, in our context, can't often change a lot outside these walls. But in this place, we understand sin is the most lethal thing in the life of a Christian. We will name it, we will confess it, repent, and walk away. Because sin separates us from God, and there can be none of it in our life. When God exposes a sin, we must turn. So how do we do that? It starts with a posture of humility. And we have to do Well, what Joseph did, we have to call sin, sin, and not pretend that it doesn't matter. It matters supremely. So we have to guard against arrogance. Arrogance is the first and foremost way that we as the church and as individuals often fall away. We fall away. So to apply this to your life, guard against arrogance. Notice it's the thing Joseph doesn't have. He doesn't have any swagger about him. He simply is. And when given the opportunity to sin secretly and go unknown, he chooses to remember that God doesn't have a blind eye to it. And no matter who he is in public, he is revealed and laid bare before God. Since we are laid bare before God, let's deal with sin intentionally. Let's understand that it starts with arrogance. There's a reason pride comes before a fall. People tell you that you deserve something. Come on, just take it. You deserve it. Right? Who, you get this pride. I've had pride and I've had God take the mallet of, I think, Christian sanctification to me and beat my life to pieces in order to work out of me the arrogance of self-satisfaction and the sense that I'm entitled. It is also arrogant not to guard yourself, to think, it's not going to happen to me, to think, it's no big deal if I go to lunch with just that one coworker, and spend extra time with him or her. It doesn't matter if I go out for drinks with some friends after work and maybe there's a little flirtation. No big deal. I'm never going to act on it, but my husband's kind of a doorknob, so why not have a little fun? I'm never going to be that wife. Arrogance. Arrogance that says it can't happen to me. The reality is it can happen to all of us. It can happen to me. It can happen to you. And the only hope we have is that God is not tolerant of sin, but he is loving to us. He desires us and calls us to himself. We have to be on our guard against arrogance. We have to understand that no matter what our choices are, we, the people of God, can't be confident in our own ability to resist temptation. Because in all honesty, it hasn't worked out real well so far, right? We'll get out of here, and we'll feel super inspired to live better, and someone's going to cut me off, and I'm like, I'm going to run that old lady right off the road. She doesn't deserve a driver's license. You know, like, I, I mean, sin will bubble up out of me like that. I'm not real good with temptation sometimes. 
you're not real good with temptation sometimes. Let's quit pretending we've got it under control and recognize he does. We don't. So we turn to the one who hated sin so much that he died to get it out of us. We've got to understand that our arrogance is frightening. And we look at these things and we can say, it's okay to have too close of a relationship with a coworker of the opposite sex. It's okay to do these little shady things on the side. It's all right, even though I'm married, I can do these things. It'll be fine. That's arrogant and it's stupid. That's just what it is. Scripture would say it no other way. It would say it no other way. So we have to understand that we are vulnerable to sin. You are vulnerable to sin. I am vulnerable to sin. But for the grace of God in Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit living in us, we have to quit trying to save face and be like, it's okay. I don't struggle. Lies. We all struggle. We super struggle. We have a lot of problems. We really have battles. But the reality is, through the Spirit of God and Christ Jesus living in us, we're not subject to sin. There will be temptation, but we don't have to sin. We can trust in the power of the Holy Spirit and not be foolish and save face and arrogant and say, no, I'll be fine. It's no big deal. And the biggest thing that I see in this culture, West Michigan culture, being an outsider who now lived here 20 years, is this. You guys are polite to a fault and you'll fall into sin by just being polite. You don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. My invitation, mash people's fingers and hurt their feelings. Get out of sinful temptation areas and you're like, I'm sorry, this is weird for me. I don't think it's good and leave. And that coworker will be like, huh, okay, it'll be horribly awkward. The next day at work will be even worse. But at least they know the wall's up. Better to get an Uber and go home than to wonder how to hide the mess you've made. Better to stop allowing temptation to be all around you thinking you're impervious. Be willing to make people uncomfortable and stand up and say, you know what, I don't do that. I'm not a part of that. Not because I'm better, but because I am super duper weak and I will fall. And you walk away. You walk away. Second thing is this. Um, Do all you can to stay away. If you're tempted by something, throw it out. Jesus said it this way. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Okay, you're good with that. That'd be weird. Just be like waving to people, you know? Like, seriously, that's what Jesus said. Because your body is not permanent. Your soul is. And if you're doing things with your body that separate you from God, get rid of it. Get rid of it. I will say this. This might be the single most terrifying conduit to the gates of hell in our lives. Right here. Pornography, social media, all these different things going on, our addiction to this stuff. You know what? Maybe you just let it go. If it's your hang up, let it go. Get a flip phone, flip phone and be trendy. <laughs> Get a little man bun. I don't know. I have a flip phone. Hello. You know, I don't care. Get rid of it. The amount of smut and pornography and brokenness being dealt with on our phones in secret is not secret to him. The church must name sin and then say it's time to run. It's time to run like there is a clown chasing us and not a happy clown, one with a bat and weird eyes, right? Run like something's chasing you, even if it's inconvenient, even if it's awkward. You've got to get rid of the temptation. You've got to flee. Your soul is more important. If you're tempted by a certain environment, don't go there. Just don't go there. Don't be like, you know what, today I feel strong, and you come out a heaping, smoldering mess. Ha, I'm weak. And don't go there. Stay away from the temptations. To be tempted is not to sin. To yield to the temptation is the problem. Run. Run. When did we think that running was a bad idea? When you're tempted by something, I would love for Zealand as a community to say, you know, I think the foundry's got a lot of runners in it. Just see a boom, 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 like running down the street. What's happening? I don't know. I think Eric's being tempted. 
you know, because he looks afraid and he's talking to himself. (laughs) You'll look crazy, but there'll be something right going on on the inside. It's time to quit pretending that we can deal with temptation on our terms. We can't. We fail every time. But we don't when we flee that which has no point or purpose in our life. The third thing is this. Understand who you sin against. Yes, you sin against other people. There are sins that happen, you know, uh, from the lighthearted Uno thing to much more serious things. And you you do hurt other people in this world. But the story of Joseph tells us one thing, and it tells it very clearly. Ultimately, sin is an issue against God. It is against his lordship and the claims of the blood of Christ over you when you live in sin, willfully and unrepentantly. It is time for the church to wake up and deal with sin as it is. You're sinning against God, and when you break relationship with God, when you break fellowship with God, it is detrimental to your life, and it breaks his heart. It is time to name what is. Sin is the single thing that separates us from God, nothing else. And we kind of go, oh, it's okay. I mean, I don't like all those things, but, you know, I want to be part of this group. I want to do this thing. At some point, we have to recognize certain behaviors, certain patterns, certain choices, certain lifestyles, certain things are just flat-out sin, and they separate us from God, and the church can't be okay with it because the last time I checked in Scripture, Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross to conquer death and hell and cover your sins, the multitude of them by his shed blood. We are not bought cheaply. Grace is not free. It was bought for you and given to you with the blood of Jesus Christ. May we as a church take seriously what Joseph taught us, that our sin, though against one another in some way, is the very thing that we can't allow because in the end, it's a sin against him who has given us his name by his blood and using his spirit within us to spread the gospel forward. How can we tolerate living in sin quietly behind closed doors when with God there is no closed doors? Pray with me. Lord Jesus, uh, I just think back to the the songs we've sung through this worship service where there is a spirit in this room and it's moving wildly and freely to convict sin, to call us into new life. And Lord, I thank you for it. I thank you, God, that you called us out of the grave and we get invited out of that dark, dank, horrible place into your glorious, brilliant light of day. And we get to be made alive in Christ Jesus. We get to be made alive. And it reveals for us this great need that, Lord, we need you in every way. We need you, God. I love that line, you're our one defense, our righteousness. God, we need you to be our defender. And our righteousness. Would you put a wall around us and protect us from the river of brokenness that flows into our lives in so many different ways? Would you guard us by your Holy Spirit? Would you be the anchor that keeps us from floating in the storms of life aimlessly and crashing our lives up against the rocks? God, would you help us because in our own power, we can do nothing, but in your power, we are more than conquerors. We are the church alive by your Spirit, and today we confess that we're tired of bearing our hidden sins. So we just lay it bare to you, God, and we ask, would you take our hearts? We give them to you freely. And would you be Lord over all that we've sought to hide? Would you forgive us for the sin? Show us the sins, even if we don't know them. And then call us according to your purposes and strengthen us for the week that lies ahead because we know temptation will come knocking soon after we leave this room. So, Lord, for this moment, we pause as a church, and we lift this next song to you as a confession, as a creed, that we give back to you what is broken. It's our heart, and it's yours, and we ask, take and make it into what you consider beautiful, and guard the hearts of us, your church, who claim you as Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, would you join me? We're going to stand. We're going to stand. find yourself today and you're like, oh my goodness, I've yielded to every temptation. I have found myself kind of wanting in this and, and you're sitting there broken. Here's the reality. It is not my job or anyone else's to convict you of sin. That's the Holy Spirit's job. If you feel this like, oh, inside of you, let the Holy Spirit point out clearly 
in your life what needs to go. And allow the conviction of the Holy Spirit to turn into the confession of sin between you and God. And you can confess your sins to God. And here's the kicker that none of us like. Repent. And that means turn away. Turn from it and walk the other direction. Right? How does Pooh Bear say it in the new movie? Where are you going? I always find, I, you know, I get where I'm going by leaving where I was. Just walk the other way. And if you need to, run. Run. Run from sin and everything because we know this. Jesus Christ is not unsympathetic to us. He was tempted in every way as you and I were, as you and I are. He was tempted in every way yet without sin. Because of Christ Jesus, today there is hope for those of us who live under the yoke of temptation. There is one who has conquered death, hell, and redeemed our sins. It is our choice now what we do with them. Do we give them to the one who died to redeem it, or do we hide and pretend it's not there? I can't answer it for you. I pray you choose to give it back to the one who has a purpose for you in all things. As you go about that, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My friends, you are dismissed. You should probably come back at four, but you're dismissed for now. <laughs>